Ah, okay. Here we go. Um, <coughs> welcome to Wireless Without Batteries. I think it's actually lecture number nine, right? Um, so here's all of the administrative announcements. First of all, we have a test one week from today here in class. Here, here in class. And uh, <coughs> that means that so let's see, that would be the 20th of February for the Shenzhen students in class test one. And that means that there's a now a window from the 20th to the 27th of February for the distance learning students to take the same test, same subject test. Uh, arrange with your proctor. I'll get the forms out to distance learning later this week. Um, now, as far as what the test covers, everything up until today minus thermoelectrics. I decided to punt that to the next class period, even though we've already covered it. I'll just keep uh, rearrange the homeworks accordingly so that you would be able to work through some of the other things. This is one of the problems with this compressed term stuff, is there's just not enough time to like practice and then evaluate and then discuss and uh, do everything. So we decided to, to make that concession, just give you a little less to study for. And this will be a closed notes, closed book, open calculator, open pencil, closed neighbor. Open mind. Test. Okay, and I will give you the cheat sheet that uh, you do. You do not make a formula sheet. I will provide that for you, which as we were talking about earlier with the Shenzhen students, that's a double-edged sword, right? That means you don't know what I'm gonna put on there. I mean, the good news though is that I put what you need. I don't really put what you don't need. At least I'm not intentionally trying to confuse you it seems to happen very easily by accident. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, that's the test. Any other any questions about the test? Do I forget anything salient that you think the distance learning sh student should know about the test that we discussed? No. Okay. So that's the test. Now for homeworks, we have three four and five posted online. Three is due Wednesday. It's an interesting little tiny mini project uh, involving predicting coverage in an AVI system or circuit analysis of a power optimized waveform. Um, and that's February the 15th, this, next, this coming Wednesday. Uh, this one is due next, no, Friday, Friday got to get it done before the test. I won't have it graded by then, by the time we send it back. But at least you'll have that practice under your belt. You can talk to me about any of the issues here on campus. And as would be February the 17th. And then five, I don't even think I've given a due date for this, right? Let's just say uh, two weeks from next Wednesday. So that would be like Wednesday the Oh gosh, wow, are we in March already at that point? Is that March the 1st? I think so, yeah. And this is actually the thermoelectrics. I just punted everything so that you wouldn't have to worry about it till after the test. Um, and then of course for the DL students you have plus seven days for each of these deadlines. 
Okay. Now, oh, uh, I don't think I've done it yet. I meant to do it this morning, but I'll do it as soon as I get a chance to go to the T-square terminal. Um, I have solutions to homework one and two. So I think I have everybody's from distance learning. The, doesn't matter at this point, it's getting late. So I'll put them online so you can check your answers to that. And maybe I'll bring paper copies of uh, homework three solution next Wednesday, this coming Wednesday and hand them out to class if anybody did that one. Okay, any questions about homeworks? No? Readings, okay, the next thing, the next administrative thing. I've uploaded a bunch of new readings to the site. So you'll call, recall lecture eight, which was last Wednesday. That was on basics of induction and inductive power transfer. So there's a corresponding reading. I, th I thought that was a really interesting reading. Um, it's from 2013 by Hui. This would be 08 Hui. And it's basically on inductive charging. It's a good reading to, to kind of drive home the uh, what's going on in the state of the art of inductive charging. This is a century old or more actually technology for charging and we are now just kind of getting to the point where we can use it for useful stuff and actually use it for inductive charging. This is how Nikolai Tesla went into power a city. We realize there's some difficult things about making power operate that way. However, when you're doing it at very small powers, it's really easy to make like a little charging map uh, charging mat, excuse me, and throw a device on it and not have to worry about plugging in. Um, you know, the, my phone is dying right now because it basically, the, the little port that I charge and has a loose connection and like unless you like hold it just right, it doesn't charge up very well, just disconnects all the time. Anytime you can eliminate a port, you can eliminate countless service uh, uh, calls from your consumer base when you're selling millions of these devices. And it pays for itself just in that sometimes. So, you know, the idea of contactless charging, getting the cord out of the system, you'll see more and more of that. And there was a really famous, uh, uh, well-known industry standard. It's called the Qi standard. That's probably a Mandarin word. What does Qi mean in Mandarin, Dylan? Yeah, does it have any cool meaning? Chi. Depends. Chi. 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 Like that? What does it mean? Strange. Okay, so it more, more applies to me than the actual charging system. Strange. Chi. I have a graduate student named Chi back home. He's from the Shenzhen, Shenzhen program. Does he mean strange? <laughs> yeah. We need the need the characters, right? Okay. I don't know the the etymology. The his the etymology would be the uh, name history of of uh, this wireless standard. But this is basically a thirteen point five six megahertz. Um, Actually, I take that back. I'm the wrong, talking about the wrong paper here. This, the Qi standard, is usually 125 kilohertz. Although there may be some other stand, uh, frequencies that they use as well. But it's an interesting article that surveys this uh, standard that came out a few years ago. And it talks about how you do wireless charging. It's the, basically the principle that we talked about last class period. Even though it was 
relatively a just sort of an in depth review of induction from your undergraduate electromagnetic days in fact i even have like videos on my you tube channel that came out of my bag class that if you need something a little more easy with some more examples and that's up for four and a six i believe talk about inductance charging charging that equivalent circuit model mutual inductance so that'll be that'll be good review I also have some undergraduate notes that I'll try to dig out somewhere I couldn't find them on my undergrad my um, a hard drive I'll see if I can load that up to the reading section the supplemental reading section not the paper section of T square so anyway the G standard is nice you've got coils that is coil like this in your device and there would be another coil or series of coils that operate exactly how we discussed last class period that you could align these with uh, so and do inductive power transfer so generally speaking if you have a single coil in the chi system you put a magnet in here and then there's also usually a magnet and a coil on the device that you're trying to charge and the idea is that those magnets align and ha help you snap the coil into the center of the other coil because we saw last cl class period we analyzed the B field along the axis of a coil it's where a lot of the, the nice maxima occurs especially if you're in that nice constant field area right on top of the coil of course there's other ways to to you'll, you'll still get flux if you have misalignment or tilt or that sort of thing but it becomes a lot more challenging and so in this type of system they sort of self align kind of force the user to align it to some sort of charging docking station and then there are also these charge mats where instead of a single coil there are a lot of coils And you just throw your phone down or your electronic device down and wherever it happens to land with its own coil inside, there's some smarts in here that detect that charge coil and it will selectively turn on the appropriate loop that maximizes the flux. So you don't have to even align things. You just have a big mat, you throw it on there you put coils, little coils all over the place. Now remember, what was the advantage of having little coils over a big coil that we saw from our field analysis? And you can guess from first principles physics. That's a better to have two coils that are roughly the same size, right on top of each other. Well, we know the right on top of each other part because you kind of wanted the centers lined up that period of that area of maximum <coughs> field and of course the more field strength you have emanating from your charging coil the better the faster you're going to charge up right the higher the H field in that region when we were very close to the coil what was the H field a function of what was the magnitude of function of it's a function of current of course what about geometry We, th we did a square coil. What was the dependence on L? Was it proportional or inversely proportional? Yeah, inversely proportional. The magnetic field is spread out over a wider area for bigger coils. As turns out, it's it's generally there's more flux through bigger coils than the same amount of current, but it's spread out over more area. So if you integrate over the area, you get a higher flux. But if you just look at the field strength, the field strength is lower compared to a lower coil with the same current. Yeah. And plus, there's also series resistance, right? If you have to send wire around a big coil as opposed to a little coil, you're going to incorporate more series resistance, more heating, more waste, et cetera. It becomes a warming mat instead of a charging mat. So all those are, are issues and why they kind of go with this sort of in 
selectively exciting, excited matrix of, of uh, coils. So anyway, I'll leave you to read that. That's the reading that goes with uh, the lecture from last week. Today's topics, I actually put two more readings up there because I think we'll probably cover this uh, third one um, today. There's lecture topic nine. And this is a 2011 research paper. There's actually been a lot of papers published on this topic, but I, I like this one particularly. Um, the authors come out of University of Washington. They might have even been with Intel Labs when they actually did this work. Uh, this is uh, written by Dr. Alonson Sample. He's a research scientist with uh, Disney Engineering. It's like your dream job, right? Work for Disney and make technology for theme parks. He's actually a friend of mine. I know him from our RFID conferences. He probably has the best electrical engineering last name of all time, right, Dr. Sample. I mean, unless your name was like Volt or something like that. I, th I think that's pretty cool. So anyway, he wrote a really nice article on a type of magnetically coupled resonator that we'll talk about today. It's, a, it's more complicated than the simple inductive loop system that we talked about last class period, but there are some benefits to doing it this way. This is really how you get uh, inductive power transfer over a broader range, how to increase the coupling between two loops. Uh, and there's some trade-offs that you have to worry about. And he does a really nice job of equivalent circuit modeling and explaining how it works. Um, I'm not going to go into gross technical detail, but I'll explain through a really nice dynamic analogy how this system works and how it's different from the simple inductive system that we studied last class period. And then if we have time, I think we probably will, we'll just knock out this uh, summary article on near field communications by Fisher. Fisher's article is on near field communication. And this is again uh, uh, an inductive based system that you now enjoy in all of your phones and sometimes pay with and that sort of thing. We'll explain just the basics of how that works. It's a pretty simple system. It's an aggregation of several inductive power, power communications type systems. And we'll explain at the high level so how that works, how it's organized, a little bit of the history around it, technologically, what are the engineering issues. And then we'll be done with the inductive communication. So we might finish up today on inductive communications. I don't know. OK, but first let's talk about the sample paper. So in your notes, this is conventional coupling. Say conventional versus overcoupled. inductive power transfer. Now, let's review. The system we talked about last class period, which is two coils that are sharing flux. We said the best way to share flux, of course, is put them right on top of each other. But that's not the only way. Uh, you can put them on the side, anywhere except for perpendicular, right? Any, anywhere that's. Uh, not parallel to the magnetic flux lines em emanating from the exciter coil. You have an exciter and you have a pickup. Okay. 
And we said that what you do in this system, here's your source or transmitter. And it's connected to a coil, which first of all, you try to tune so that it self resonates. It's got some, let's call this loop resistance, C loop. And it has L1, a mutual inductance that couples with the loop. Has a, um, this this second area, of course, is usually a contactless integrated circuit card that has an RF ID in it, an inductive RF ID in it, um, or it could be your charging mat cell. And the principles of operation for the system is actually pretty straightforward, right? You have an exciter, you have a pickup. If you want to optimally tune this system. We said that you pick, all you have to do is individually tune each loop for resonance, and everything kind of falls out. It doesn't really matter what the coupling coefficient is. At that point, your frequency of resonance is designed so that 1 over the square root of C loop times L1 should be the same as 1 over the square root of C coil L2. And we said that the Thevenin equivalent as impedance as seen by the source of this system is going to be R loop minus 1 over, or plus 1 over J. 2 pi f c loop plus j 2 pi f l1 plus 4 pi squared f squared m squared over r coil plus whatever you put in a load there plus j 2 pi f l 2 plus 1 over j 2 pi f c coil. All that math to explain that really you're just trying to get rid of these reactive components when you tune in this manner. Uh, yes, do you have a question? No, okay. I thought you were raising your hand. I'm sorry. And this sort of gives you the ideal transfer. Now, the really neat thing about this is to think about it. It doesn't matter whether my two loops are right on top of one another in this model or if they're on the other side of the room, right? It doesn't matter. You still tune them to 1 over the square root of C loop C L1. Just tune them similarly, and they will have inductive coupling. The, the shared flux between those to might be extremely low and might be a tiny immeasurable amount if you take them to the other side of the room because magnetic field falls off so quickly. But it still couples. And if you made everything out of superconductors and didn't have any loss in your environment, it really wouldn't matter if you tuned it how far you went away because ZTH, let's call this the ideal superconductor case, This is basically, okay, our loop, that goes to zero. Reactive components, gone. The only thing left 
as the coil impedance re resistance also goes to zero and those reactive components go away, is this. And the really nice thing about that is, well, if, if you put a, as a Z, ZL a load, whatever power you supply to that feminine equivalent impedance, where does it go? The load. So at that point, it almost doesn't matter what M is, right? Whatever M is, is going to, it, it, whatever power you dump into the system is all going to go into that load anyway, no matter what M is. This is a 100% efficient transfer system. Now, of course, what's the real problem with that? Well, if M is really low, you don't get a useful voltage out of the system to do anything. You also don't have. You also have this issue where um, even a small amount of coil resistance or inductor resistance in the, in the coil at the transmitter or the receiver, even a small amount of resistance will dominate in series with this tiny coupling value because it's m squared, right? So this this creates a problem. Like really we could operate with a realistic coil and still get fairly efficient coupling if we were allowed to do some impedance transformation along the way, right? So, there was an experiment you can see on the vi a video from like seven, six or seven years ago at least, these MIT grads that uh, got together and powered a light bulb so they were all sitting on a couch here. These are MIT students. They're, well, they're, they're MIT students, so they're probably not that happy. They didn't go to Georgia Tech. And they had some exciter coil here, and then something connected to a 100 watt light bulb over here. And you know they're getting distances of several meters away. You know, the, and there have been startups launched in the U.S. of this. I don't think I've, there's been like a real big home run in financially in any of this. This isn't anybody's home yet anywhere in the world that I can tell. But uh, the idea would be you could have one of these coils that you just hang on the wall, and then all of a sudden everything in the room is uh, plug-free. And the neat thing too is that that that. Uh, it's not just for things that take a few milliwatts of power. You could do this for a light bulb, which draws watts of power, or your television set. You know, it's an interesting technology because this coincides with this really great drop in power supply that, that's required to drive some of our consumer uh, electronics. You don't need a couple kilowatts to drive your television set anymore. It's not a big clunky CRT that burns power up in coils. You know, now we've got these fancy LED displays and the whole thing, you know, your whole set top may only operate with 100 watts of power. You still can't dry your hair with this stuff, but hair drying is something that takes over a kilowatt of power usually. It's a good way to break the, burn a uh, circuit breaker, trip the circuit breaker. But, okay, so we, this is the idea. And they did it, it's based essentially on this idea of induction that we talked about, but they're using something special called uh, an overcoupled system. And the paper that I want you to take a look at the setup is kind of like this. You've got a transmitter and then you have something called a drive loop. This drive loop feeds a TX coil. And then there's a similar RX coil. And then there's a load loop. 
which then connects to your power load. I say conventional systems don't really work beyond the dimension of their largest loop. This is a rule of thumb that I teach to my tech students all the time back in Atlanta, the undergraduates. It says if you're doing induction for senior design and you're trying to design uh, a loop exciter, don't ex if it's L distance long, don't expect it to work more than L distance away. And this is a way to increase, the, the technique here is to increase the coverage area by almost a factor of 10. And so the equivalent circuit model looks something like this. Of course, the trick here is to get the most power and the most voltage to your load resistor right there. Okay? And I'll label these components. This is C1. This is L1. So we've got the capacitance and the self-inductance of the first loop. You tune the capacitance to resonate it at the frequency desire of desired operation. You've got RP1 and RP2. These are coupled, call that M1 to 2. Then there's also, th so this is basically corresponding to the things that I've drawn above it. This loop here is the drive loop. This is a similar transmit coil loop that's very close. So these are tightly coupled to one another. Then there's a good bit of distance between these two. So this is M2 to 3. And of course, we've tuned these individual loops. This is C2. This is C3. This is RP3 and RP4. L3 and L4. So this loop here, the RX coil, is modeled by this simple tank circuit. This is just a simple RLC circuit tuned to resonance. And there's a coupling between that and the load loop. L3 and L4 are mutually coupled. We'll saw that M3 to 4. And of course, there should also be some coupling coefficient between the RX coil and the drive loop, and the drive loop and the load loop, and also the TX coil and the load loop. But it turns out that those don't really matter in the system. They're either insignificant or they don't contribute that much to the system. It's this successive coupling that really drives what we're talking about. Um, OK, so. So here comes the analogy, right? We were dealing with a simple resonance circuit in our previous example. You can model all that with a, uh, a resonance in a, in a loop is a, almost like an oscillator, right? If you have a mass, for example, at the end of a spring, right? If I start tapping the mass, I give energy to it. 
and I get a very efficient system at transferring energy if I tap the mass at the natural resonance of the system, right? It depends on the mass and the spring constant. You remember that stuff from uh, mechanical physics. So there's a natural frequency we call resonance that if I start tapping that mass, I impart power to it very efficiently. Almost doesn't matter how much the force is, where, uh, as long as it's the resonant frequency of the system. This system up here is analogous to the following mechanical system. Let's say I had two pendulums and they are swinging back and forth and they are connected by a spring. And they have the freedom to move back and forth. Okay, I've obviously got a more complicated system because now I've got these loops that connect to one another and are coupled to one another. What I find here though is that when I have this more complicated system there are now two frequencies of operation that I could that lead to two different solutions. So There's this mode where the pendulums are swinging back and forth with respect to one another. And if you view one pendulum as the transmitter and one of them as the receiver, then they're, pro they're in resonance with one another. They're both swinging at their natural frequency. If they're driven at that frequency, they will, transmitter one will impart energy efficiently to transmitter number two. And in the overcoupled system, You also get another mode. Where they're now out of phase with respect to one another. Or not out of phase, but basically, you know, going back and forth like this and they're still imparting energy. And that's actually, these are two different resonances. And it turns out this overcoupled system, if, if you operate in an overcoupled mode, then you can transfer efficiently over longer scale distances. You're giving something up important though in order to do this. What is it you're giving up? Well, it turns out that the frequency of operation here, when you are in an overcoupled mode, becomes dependent on the uh, coupling coefficient between your inductors. So in other words, as I move my devices farther and farther apart, I may actually have to change the frequency of operation in order to get that coupling with the same hardware. In the experiment that they do here, they actually do that manually. They've got uh, a pickup coil one page, uh, I'll just describe it rather than bringing it up electronically, rummaging through it. When they're figure five, they've got a drive loop and then the, parent, the passive loop that goes around it, uh, the coil, and they change the coupling coefficient just by changing the angle, right? By changing the angle, you reduce the flux, and you can change the coupling coefficient between the drive loop 
and the transfer loop. There are other ways to, to do that electronically. They just chose that one amount. So, but all of these systems that are based kind of on that MIT technique for uh, overcoupled systems behave in kind of the same similar manner. You have extra coils that are not just uh, there to couple between one another, but also to step up voltages. Um, I know we're past break time, but I just want to finish up with this before we do a quick break. So to give you an idea, these are sort of the, the key equations. V load of V source at resonance is equal to where KLC is the coupling coefficient for that number between 0 and 1. Between the loop and the coil. So that drive loop and that multi-wound coil that was the second loop in our equivalent circuit. That's what LC, I'm just using the paper's terminology. And of course, the Q factor is really the conventional Q factor for um, an RLC circuit. 1 over R times L over C. The quality factor of your resonator. And this expression assumes that you have a symmetrical pickup coil driver arrangement for both the source and the receiver. And that's why it only boils down to the quality factor of two loops instead of four loops. It assumes the right-hand side is built just like the left-hand side. So you have a Q coil and a Q loop. The loop, of course, is the single loop of the driver or load and then in their paper the multi loop coil of the transmitter and receiver and basically the, the less lossy the resonator is the easier it is to get the voltage from the source to show up at the voltage in the load, right? We have this KLC, loop to coil resonance, or uh, quick coupling. We said that's from zero to one, and we've got to square it. So if you have very high Q resonators here, then this, this term over here dominates, and you get close to one. And so I actually went and I saw this demonstration given like five or six years ago when I went to visit Intel Labs uh, before they'd shifted over, uh, some of the personnel had shifted over to University of Washington. And it was interesting, they, they, uh, they had the whole setup there and they had a, a you know, one or 200 volt RF amplifier uh, on one of the coils. And then they had just an incandescent light bulb which you know operated at US standard 110 volts. I don't know if they were actually making it to uh, that many volts on the output, but it was enough to light the thing up pretty substantially and get, get light out of it. And I was warned not to touch it because there was lots of voltage going around these coils. But I was, of course, interested as an EMAG professor, was looking all over it, seeing what was going on.
Okay, that's a good spot for a break. We'll meet back in about 10 minutes. Oh, welcome back. Can you think of any questions before? Oh, yes. Uh, about the pendulum, if mm -hmm. they are in the same phase, um, if they are, how say, the, the coupling circuits are symmetric on the right hand side and the, uh, on the two sides, mm -hmm. then I think maybe the, uh, how say, the spring, spring will not um, how say, change length. And uh, then how, then how, how is it related to the uh, coupling, yeah, the inductive coupling uh, coefficient that I'm choosing? Because they, uh, they will not have force mm. within the spring, with the spring, so then. Yeah, so, so the, the analogy there is if you have a pendulum, each of the individual pendulums has a natural resonance, right? So if you connect them with a spring, there are two modes of excitation, right? You can have them move in unison, and that transfers power efficiently at one frequency, and then you can have them move like this at a different frequency. Yeah, but, but if they are exactly in the same phase and the, with the exactly the same uh, frequency yeah. and the same length, yeah. uh, identical, and then the spring will not have force. That's right. That would be the first solution. Uh, then, because of why, then uh, how is it related to the M23? Because then, uh, because I, I think even in the circuit, if it, it is in the same phase, it will have inductance. That's true. Mm -hmm. then, then how come these two are kept and uh, nanos? How do you how do you reconcile the analogy in that case? Um, let's see. Well, I don't think in that analogy, I don't think there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the spring coefficient and the mutual inductance. So it's it's just meant to be an analogy. There's there's two modes of that dynamical system, and the differential equations look like. The, the same thing that's going on with this mutual system. But I don't think there's necessarily, you can't necessarily say this spring coefficient is just like the coupling coefficient of, I guess they're both called K, so it could be, it's maybe a confusing analogy, right? The spring constant is a K and the, the inductive uh, coupling coefficient is also a K. But I don't think there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. If you wanted to make a dynamic correspondence, that k in the spring coefficient may be a big algebraic expression of multiple coupling and inductive terms. I would have to, you have to get in, there, there's grotesque detail of how to model the circuit in the uh, sample paper. And so what, you, what you're looking at is uh, in equation three, I don't know if you have the paper in front of you, but uh, this very long circuit modeling equation that's a function of all the mutual inductances and coupling coefficients and loads and impedances that uh, tell you how to calculate the ratio of V sub L to V sub S, the so load source to the uh, load voltage to the source voltage. We'd have to go through and derive the differential equation that der that uh, governs the two pendulums with a spring, and try to draw a correspondence. That might be an interesting homework exercise. I think Mulan just we invented a really good homework problem. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, any, anyone else uh, have any pro questions or issues you want to talk about or doubts? No? Okay. So the last phase of our um, inductive transfer discussion, I want to talk some about near field communications. This is a fun class to teach because 
you know, we get to talk about real sciencey stuff, lots of math, lots of physics. And we also get to talk about very practical things, like how, how cutting edge technology works. And so near field communications, which is really at the heart of all these payment technologies that are rolling out for smartphones and everything, that has actually been around for a while. And I'll give you a little history of it. In the 1990s, we saw this proliferation of inductive card technologies, inductive smart card technologies. And did anyone ride the bus today to get here? Anyone? Raise your hand if you did. Nobody? Y'all y'all have a car? Metro. The Metro. Oh, yeah. Okay, so you ride, you used your Shenzhen Tong card for the Metro, right? That had a chip in it and inductive windings. And I think I showed a picture of the inset that I ripped out of one of those fare cards from in Atlanta. It's the same thing. Uh, <clears throat> and it, it showed you sort of the anatomy of what one of those things looks like. Well, all these started to proliferate in the 90s because all of a sudden we could make chips that didn't require uh, five volts and uh, two amps to drive and actually you know they could have a programmable memory they could power up digital logic on a relatively low voltage and a low current draw until the late 90s there, there were a lot of these systems that were proliferating and the, the near field communications, which, let me get the numbers right here. Near field communications is ISO, International Standards Organization, 18092. And this itself is also uh, an amalgam of standards. So this is the near field communication standard. And it incorporates several other standards. Uh, for example, another ISO standard called 14443. It's a smart card standard. These are all operating at 13 megahertz because there's an unlicensed band down there that's just 13.45 uh, to be exact. And there's, there were some other standards by Sony and some other smart card standards incorporated into here. And these were basically all in existence before 1809. Somebody says, well, there's, there's two things that we want to do here. We want to make small devices that can serve to read and emulate smart cards, these proliferating cards that people were using. That way you could have a really smart device that you could read cards with and get their information out. And then you could turn around and have it mimic a card to uh, basically you know, serve as the bus pass or the ATM card or the Shenzhen Metro Pass or the Hong Kong Octopus card that they use across the border. And so even the, the technology had ar already been established and was starting to mature. And it was really a question of, we need a standard that can bring all these together and then also have devices that could serve as both readers and cards. Because before this, you just had readers. You had cards, you had readers, and the idea of, of having something that could be a reader and then turn around and be a card was sort of alien. So. The way that your phone works here, there's a coil built into the casing or sometimes it's even on the battery itself. And this is an NFC coil antenna. And sometimes there's just one little chip, an application specific integrated circuit that connects to your smartphone. And 
there are several different modes that this thing, <coughs> thing can do. It can act as a reader when the phone is on. It can act as a tag when the phone is on. But remember, it's supposed to emulate a tag. So in theory, some of these devices could even be configured to act like tags when the phone is off. In other words, it's set to mimic a card, and the phone might be off, but if it senses power on the pickup coil, it will power up the chip and then dump whatever contents of memory according to the appropriate pro protocol. So if it's a reader, let's say you're programming this with a card. If you're a reader, you power up any tag that gets close to you. And because there were so many standards for smart card tags that had already proliferated and there was no single standard, there are several different standards built into this NFC protocol. And so what, what your phone does is it actually kind of spends fraction of a second looking for one protocol and then it switches to another protocol, puts out a query or whatever identifying thing to see if there's any tags of that type protocol, then the next one, then the next one. And it kind of goes around until it comes full circle again. And that's how it works with different different cards. But the ideal is, is uh, inductive power transfer. Now, and once the card powers up, it operates ba based on that same circuit model that we talked about last class period, where you have inductive loops and a little load, and that chip is essentially the load in this setup, and that chip will change its load. It will load modulate passively, which can then be detected by the reader, in this case your phone <coughs> or handheld device. And that's how you pull information off. You can also send information to an NFC tag uh, to initiate communications or give it other types of commands like write to memory or erase your memory or you know, repeat what you last said because I didn't hear, hear it right the first time. You amplitude modulate the forward signal. Usually there's a time where you just transmit CW to power everything up. Once you're uh, assured you have enough time that everything is powered up, then you start sending commands high-low, high-low to the tag and then the tag will reflect back using that load, what is effectively inductive load modulation. So that's reader to tag. And then of course it has a tag emulation mode. And in this case, you can emulate the presence of a smart card. And you can make this passive or not passive. For example, passive or active. Tags are meant to power up even in the absence uh, of any onboard power supply. So you could charge up, do your circuit thing, uh, send your information out and charge out and never actually be connected to the phone's power source. The phone batteries died, but you may still be able to ma make uh, payments. I'm not sure how many of the phones actually incorporate this into what they're doing, but this is uh, um, certainly this is possible and has been proposed in a lot of designs. Or you could simply use this incoming signal from the reader when you're in emulation mode to detect the presence of a ring. And you can just use the power supply of the phone to provide all of the circuit functioning that you need to do that. Obviously, the second one's a little more reliable than the first one. 
and there's a, you want to be in communications with your phone anyway uh, when you want to exchange information or load a credit card number or something into there. And what's interesting about this is that there's another, I don't think this is used very much, you don't hear much about it, but most of these devices can also act in a reader to reader mode where you get two inductive coils and but you're using the inductive medium just like you would with a tra tra conventional transmit and receive chain. You know, you've got a detector on the load and you've got a source and you modulate commands high and low to, to your detector. And then when it time, it's time to acknowledge or return information in the link, they switch roles. And this device now at, engages its detector into the loop and now the other device, device number two, becomes the transmitter. Has anybody used that mode in one of your phones before? Do you have a phone enabled with that? Do you, like a beaming mode, they have some fancy name for it. Uh, not many people use it, but you can you know, bump your phones together and transfer information. It's not very high rate because none of this stuff is really designed for high rate transfer, but if you want to give your contact information. Can you stop or, when you like ah, yeah, yeah, that's probably using that mode then in that in instance. So they're basically three modes, reader to reader, reader to tag, and then tag emulation mode. And your, your phone can in enter into either of those three. So each of those three modes is built around multiple standards. So really it's just a matter of coding up all these different contingencies. To emulate a tag like the uh, Sony FIL ICA standard, would I want to be a 14443 tag? Would I want to be a reader? Or am I doing this bizarre conduct inductive reader to reader transfer? Which isn't that bizarre? It's just like any wireless transmission at that point. You're just concentrating more on the H field than you are the E field or doing near field instead of traveling waves, but there's nothing really any different about that than, you know, turning on your cell phone and communicating with a tower at that point. Now, as for the tag emulation, There is one issue that you have to deal with electromagnetically that's a little different than a conventional carded system. Now, if you think about it, your card is a plastic device. And you're going to bring it up to a coil, which is usually at least as big, if not bigger, than. the plastic loop, the loop inside the plastic coil. And this was originally how the technology was designed to function. And as we know, the frequency of resonance that allows maximum power transfer in this system is a simple one over square root of LC. And L and C don't change depending on the orientation of this thing. The, the mutual flux does, but the operating frequency does not change the resonant frequency. It's a very nice system. Y'all, one of the things you always have to worry about in what radio system is how is the user going to use this technology? This is a chronic problem with things like cell phones, right? If I take a phone and I hold it up to my head, sometimes I hold it up to my head, sometimes I'm browsing like this, and sometimes the phone belongs to a left-handed person, and I browse like this, and I talk like this. And sometimes you have it on the phone, the, the, um, the tabletop, and you're just typing into it, right? All these ways and more. There are a thousand ways that people have thought of to use phones uh, into plastic holders. Now, all these scenarios create a nightmare for uh, antenna engineers because when you design an antenna, class, the, the conventional way to do it is you program up your antenna, you code it up in one of these uh, uh, solvers and you study how it radiates in free space. 
and you get an antenna impedance, and you get a radiation pattern, you get an efficiency, you get all these parameters we talked about it at the first couple of weeks of class. Well, now you take that same antenna and you put it next to the human head. The human head is salt water, has a very high permittivity, relative permittivity, it has a big loss tangent, it has conductivity, it screws up everything. It changes the pattern, it throws the impedance way down on the scale, and so what you thought was matched was now highly mismatched, and it's not even radiating in the direction that you thought. And then you think, okay, maybe I should design to the head case, because everybody's going to talk to the phone. Which in that scenario doesn't work very well, because now you pick it up with your hands, a completely different electromagnetic scenario. You lay it on the table, completely different. You put it in your pocket, you're awaiting a call, completely different. It's up against a, a giant thigh, you know, that's conductive, completely different. So the UHF and microwave antenna design that is actually used by human beings is really difficult. The smart card, by comparison, one of the real advantages of this induction technique is, is that it's relatively impervious to stuff nearby, especially human body stuff, right? Because these systems are going to be more influenced by permeability rather than permittivity, right? And you're going to need a lot of conductivity if you're going to affect this circuit, if you're going to be able to change the resonance or not. So I can hold this plastic card with my hand. You know, I can try to cover it up with both hands. It'll still read. You'll look like an idiot, but you should try that on the subway next time. Cover it up with both hands and put your hand like that. Put, it, put your hand on the back side. You could cover it with aluminum foil. But I guess I think if uh, I got to do a skin depth calculation to see if that'll even knock it out. Like it'll attenuate it significantly, but there are some systems that might, that might, one layer of aluminum foil might not be enough. You have to do some calculations. Okay, so that's the conventional usage. A little bit different when you're incorporating the tag onto a metal phone, right? You can tune the tag itself to resonate at 13.56 megahertz in the presence of all this. As long as you've got some tuning capability, that's fine. You can do that. In fact, some people even do it automatically on a chip. You just have a bank of capacitors that you select selectively bring on to you know, increase or decrease the amount of capacitance that is due to whatever inductance that you're getting around here. So you design a loop that's 13.56 megahertz. Yeah, the, the, at the very last minute, the in this case, the Apple uh, phone designers changed the setup or maybe where the uh, coil was exactly attached to the, um, the phone itself, and that throws off your inductance calculations. Okay, a lot of times modern circuitry has the capability to adjust within a you know, a certain percentage of error to, to deal with that situation. But um, it's different when you are going from reader to reader or from handset to handset, from device to device. Now you've got two things with metal housings, not just a piece of plastic with a winding in it. And the presence of one case is going to influence the self-inductance and hence the resonance of the other coil and vice versa um, so that there's more chance for detuning the two coils that are brought close when you're doing a device to device type communication so there, there's a there's two ways to deal with this problem one you could just take your medicine on the chin or take it on the chin, take your fight on the chin. Got it. Can't mix my uh, analogies here. And in this case, you just do conventional load modulation. And you hope the fact that this additional inductance or capacitance that is uncanceled in the system still allows communication. So you could do your passive mod load modulation and just hope that 
the circuit is sensitive enough to compensate for that. That's what most people do. Um, but you can also do something called active load modulation. And in this case, inside your chip, and this is something you can do, especially when you get power. You actually have a little voltage source that you turn on and off inside your chip. And the interesting thing is, from the reader's perspective, if your device is emulating If your device is emulating this, how can you tell if, from the reader's perspective, if you have an active device or a passive device? Because the way these systems work is the reader energizes, in both cases, the reader energizes the system. And then it looks to see how much is my feminine equivalent impedance? How much current am I drawing in state one versus state two? And the, the, your tag in this instance, over here or over here, your chip is basically load modulating, switching out different ZLs in the left-hand side, or in this case, adding voltage source on and off. Well, let's start with another question. What's the advantage of doing it to the right versus the left? Why would I want to do a source instead of just flipping between resistors? Yeah. Because the passive one we cannot modulate at the end. Yeah, that's right. You're limited in your passive circuit by whatever power is coming in, right? You can only change between two states. Uh, or you can change between two states, but they're two passive states. So whatever whatever information you can couple back passively, that's what you're limited by. But on the right hand side, we are that's right, you've got a source. So you can actually add power. You can send more power back than what you receive. And in this way, you can overcome some of these limitations with the, that limit range and tuning effects of inductive coupling. It doesn't affect the overall range that much when you do an active system, because remember, the fields fall off of these coils so darn much. I double the coil disk separation distance. I've increased the loss by two to the sixth, right? By a factor of 64 every time I double these systems. So unless this is going to add orders and orders of magnitude more power, it's really not going to help me out that much in absolute range. Yeah, make, make it so that I can use the things this, this far away instead, I can, instead of having to put them right up against one another. But that does a couple things, right? If I can get them close but not touching, there's less tuning of detuning effects. And even if there is detuning effects, the additional power can help make up for that. Because as I bring these things together at weird angles and close to one another, I may shift the system so that the thing is now detuned and operates at 11 megahertz instead of 13.56. With this additional power, I can still send power over. So back to my original question, how does a reader know which which system is operating. Is it, can the reader tell between a passive load modulator or an active load modulator in this circuit? You let resistance of the diode change because of the current. So. 
Well, yeah, the, the resistance will change. So I could switch between two passive resistive loads on the left hand tag for my passive load modulation. And that will change the current draw, the real current draw, if everything's kind of resonating properly. Or I can basically change the voltage. If it's in phase, I can change the voltage on the right hand side. And that will also change the current draw. So keep in mind, in this case a reader has a source that's continuously powering up and then has some detection circuitry in parallel to measure the current that it's drawing. And this, that source is always on in the reader, at least during the reading period. Well, the answer is you can't. You can't reliably detect, detect it every time. And there's the trivial case where my active load modulation is actually putting more power back to the, uh, the reader than the reader could possibly send out. So at some point, if I'm sending so much power over using this type of communication scheme, I'm sending so much power over, then I, I've obviously, I'm obviously not using passive load modulation. But generally, generally speaking, that's not going to happen even if you're using active mo mode modulation. You get a weak change that you register in your reader coil, and you don't know whether that's uh, passive or active load modulation if everything is kind of synced up. So anyway, this, this is how your phone is working. This is what your phone is doing the next time you make a payment or emulate your card. They need to make an app. I mean, the hardware is there. They need to make an app so that you can suck it out of your, uh, suck out your Shenzhen Tong card and ride with your uh, Apple Pay. But who knows what you would do to the, the fair amounts if it was in your phone. Somebody would hack it and have unlimited rides on the Shenzhen bus, right? You would never do that, would you? <laughs> Buzzwood? Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> okay, we are out of time.